so nice to see you. My name is Clark Wolf. I'm so excited for our show today and hopefully for years to come. Uh, this is the show where we are going to be talking all things genre, film, television, games, comics, you name it. And I have an incredible panel here to kick off our premiere episode. First, sitting to my left, Miss Perry Nimmerai. Oh Just kidding. Boy. Perry We're Nimmerai. Start that today, aren't we? <laughs> hey guys, thank you so much for all the support the past couple of days and for voting. And thank Thank you to Ryan Levy for that amazing theme song. We love it. Yes, I hope you guys enjoyed your choice, your pick for our Collider Nightmares theme. Sitting to her left, we have Mr. John Schnepp. Hey, what's up? So happy to be here. Big horror fan. Uh, Clark has been talking about doing this show for a long time, so great to kick it off. Let's get talking about monsters. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Schnepp. And sitting to my right, the one and only Mr. Mark Riley. Oh my God, I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, panel. Clark, thank you so much for homework. I stayed in a dark cabin in the woods where allegedly a dark forest would visit me at 2.48 a.m. True story. And did it, did it? Because I saw that tweet. I know, it did not, actually. I was a little uh, disappointed. I'm not yeah. going to lie. I was I saw like, the tweet, too. I was like, I hope it happens. Yeah, I got to tweet my peeps on the panel and go, I can't believe this is happening right now. But uh, no, just a mass killer asking for a cup of sugar. That's, that's it. That's, that's it. fair. That's yeah. tame. Tame yeah. enough. Tame enough. All right, guys. So let's launch into our very first segment. So what's interesting about and fun about today's show is that we get to tell you all about the things that we're going to be doing week to week and some rotating segments. And first up is our weekly movie news segment titled, very appropriately, Fresh Meat. Yeah. Creepy. Fresh meat. I love it. So this is where we're going to be bringing you the latest in movie news. And since we've had some really cool breaking stuff over the last couple of weeks, we're going to go over those things right now. Starting with... <laughs> Halloween. Yes. All right, so the big news, of course, was that after shifting studios and many, many delays, it was announced that Blumhouse Productions, uh, the guys from Insidious, Sinister, Paranormal Activity, The Purge, pretty much every major horror franchise now, are going to be teaming up with the one and only Mr. John Carpenter on the new Halloween movie. This was very exciting. Now, Carpenter is on as executive producer. And uh, there's rumors, I don't know if it's actually confirmed or not as I hit this microphone, that um, he may indeed be doing the score mm -hmm. for the new film, which is very, very exciting. Uh, the release date will be sometime October 2017, and candidates for director include uh, Blumhouse favorite Mike Flanagan, who directed Oculus and Hush, and also in the running, allegedly, is the one and only Mr. Adam Wingard mm -hmm. of Your Next, The Guest, etc. So, first things first, Harry, what are your thoughts on this new partnership for Halloween? So this was really cool. I was actually at the event where they made this big announcement. We were all sitting in a tiny screening room in Blumhouse, and they wouldn't tell us why we were coming. So we're all sitting there like, what could this be? Are they going to show us footage from The Purge? Are they going to announce, you know, Ouija 3, God forbid? <laughs> uh, but no, no. They, they all come out. And then when they introduce John Carpenter, I mean, my heart just stopped. I've, ne I've never been in the same room with him. So my mind was pretty much blown in that scenario but I like the idea of him being involved I don't necessarily think that's a reason for everybody to think this is the ha Halloween movie that is gonna mm. you know make this franchise big again mm. so don't get too carried away but during the presentation Jason Blum kept saying we're gonna try to get him to do the score we're gonna try to get him to do the score and John Carpenter just like stood there munching on his popcorn <laughs> so maybe they'll make it happen I hope they do because that's one of my favorite parts about the original movie yeah. but overall I'm into this idea pretty much because the whole group there was stressing the point of bringing it back to the original and keeping things simple mm -hmm. and that's what makes Halloween so special is that it is just simply a story about this man, this figure, mm -hmm. stalking and attacking other people somewhat for no rhyme or reason. Sure. Yeah, yeah he's just a force. Um, you know, Schnepp, I know you are a huge John Carpenter fan. Mm -hmm. Did the idea that he's on board, the fra back on board the franchise in an official executive producer capacity excite you? To a certain degree. I mean, I'm a little bit more of a wait and see type person like of the names you brought up to direct it Adam Wingard is the one that stands out to me uh, he's a great director he's a genre director he loves horror he understands horror him and Simon uh, his mm -hmm. writing partner Simon Barrett have uh, done so much amazing stuff over the past few years 
uh, that if his name was announced, then I would be a little more tied into it. Just having someone on as an executive producer means nothing to me because I've seen that happen since, I, since I've been watching films. People get attached. Yeah, he's executive producing. What is he eating popcorn, getting stoned in the corner? Or is he actually there every day making sure it's a true thing, the shape is back? But I don't care either way that John Carpenter is back as opposed to like the way Rob Zombie kind of did it like his way yeah. and like really got into the origin and everything like that. Like, you don't, I don't need to know somebody's lineage and where did his parents come from and what did he eat for breakfast when he was five? I don't give an F. It's like, that does not matter in the horror genre. And I think so many times when you get into the explain-o version, yeah. you ruin it. And I think that's what John Carpenter was saying. Look, he is a force of nature. He is the shape. Yep. He's a creature that murders and is out for revenge. And I think that that's what they're gonna get back to, the back to basics kind of thing. That's the kind of fun of the slasher films that like a lot of people got into and that's what I think they want to return to. I, I also have heard that he's doing the music, which he, is part of the amazing thing, the fun of the original first two Halloween. So I'd love to see them return to that and then you know go a little further, but I don't need to see, you know, it, like, like, you know what I mean? I, yeah, I, sure. I just need it to be like, a good director, that's well, what it needs. Well, Carpenter has also been touring with these albums, so oh, yeah. clearly music is on his mind. I don't know if we'll actually get an official score, though. Riley, what about you? What are your thoughts on this? Oh, first off, amen, Schnepp. I love that <laughs> because, yes, Halloween, my favorite movie of all time. Mm. Uh, horror, it's my number one, okay? So to bring back John Carpenter, and I was kind of talking to Perry about this off air, mm -hmm. just to have him near the project mm -hmm. is amazing. We're going to get a better movie now. Right. Just to have, I mean, if he fires off an email, stoned or otherwise, at least it's John Carpenter weighing in on the Halloween franchise. Right. And I love that they talk about going back to the basics. Yeah. I've read this screenplay, the original screenplay, probably 15 times. He has never described, unless it's Michael My when they say, like Donald Pleasant says, Michael Myers escaped. He is referred to in the script as The Shape. And that is so telling of this movie and the roots of this movie. He is a force of nature. He is a dark shape that just, and, and to, to base it on the babysitter killers, mm -hmm. the oldest you know thing in the book that scares the hell out of me is you're at home alone with the babysitter and you hear in a mental escape patient, mm -hmm. okay? That is just the recipe for a perfect slasher movie, which I love, so I hope they do go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. Just all of this makes me happy. Now I'm with you again, Schnepp. If Adam Wingard is brought in as the director, oh my God, sign me up, I'm lining up right. now. So there you go. You know, it's. Um, I definitely think that in terms of the partnership, Blumhouse uh, has got the low budget thing down. That's right. for sure. That's sure. kind of their hallmark is that they make movies for less than $3 million, usually, unless we're talking about a, a franchise sequel or something like that. But, um, you know, I got to say, I was really surprised by this, only because... I feel like the Blumhouse uh, brand is very commercial, and yeah. and this is a this is a brand that makes movies that you know people teenagers want to go see often. Ghost stories set in one house. It doesn't really jive with the Halloween mythology so much as sure, far as yeah. I know it. Um, however, Ryan Turek, my former uh, Bloodcast co-host and uh, formerly of Shock Till You Drop, is over there running development. He is a huge Halloween <laughs> fan. This he was there during the announcement. This has his finger prints all over it so in that respect I do think it's in pretty good hands but yeah. we uh, the director I agree with all of you guys on the panel the director is going to be the thing that makes or breaks it and speaking of Flanagan uh, Mike Flanagan he also directed Oculus 2 or no no uh, Ouija 2 which I know you're very excited about <laughs> you know I want to just back I don't hate Ouija quite like the large majority. I don't either I don't think it really was as bad as everyone I made agree. it out to it's be pretty and horrible. It. it's pretty horrible it's bad oh, it's pretty yeah. bad come on yeah sorry it sucks <laughs> Well, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully having someone like Flanagan on board will will improve its quality tremendously. All right, next up, this was also incredible news. I feel like there's been so much major horror stuff breaking recently. Everyone's favorite guy, Stephen King. Uh, Stephen King's It has been in the works at New Line for so long. As we all know, Carrie Fukunaga from True Detective uh, and Beasts of No Nation was attached. He'd been developing the film for a very, very long time. 
and uh, and he left the project back in 2015 over creative differences. But before he went, he cast a young actor from We're the Millers and uh, and uh, The Revenant, uh, Will Poulter. So there was some question when uh, Andres Moschietti, Mus- I'm trying to do it, guys. Sorry, I, I apologize, uh, Andres, if I m- butchered your name. But um, there was question, is Will Poulter going to stay on as Pennywise? And we learned very recently that he is not. Hemlock Grove star and Skarsgård aplenty, uh, <laughs> Phil Skarsgård, <laughs> is going to be uh, filling those clown shoes. So, Schnepp, how do you feel about this casting? Well, this is the 19th Skarsgård. Stellan is just <laughs> busy. You know, I don't know how many Skarsgårds there are, but um, I haven't seen him in Hemlock Grove, so I don't really have any kind of gauge on his acting ability. He looks... Uh, he looks like a mass murderer, you know, from the photo. So, you know, perhaps. Really? You think that he looks. Yeah, it's you, those people really? who always are the ones God. that are mass murderers. I've got the 40 bodies in the basement. That's the, the face. Man. Um, but yeah, I can imagine him in a Pennywise outfit. I mean, it's really hard to replace Tim Curry. Yeah. Because uh, that's kind of the best part of the TV show. It wasn't If you watch it again now, it's not really that scary. Yeah. It's very TV esque. It's kind of low budget. Yeah. I think John Boy is in it and a bunch of other kind of like TV actors. I can't remember if he's in it. It feels like a John Boy Walton kind of thought. But, uh, you know, they float. I want to see the new version. Mm-hmm. So that's why I can say, like, look, you know, let's get on. I like the idea that Fukunaga had is breaking the film into two parts. And it uh, looks like that's what they're doing now, even without him involved. So Sure. And so, Riley, you know, this is this is a pretty big role. And one of yeah. the things that was really interesting to me, at least, was when Will Poulter was cast, I was shocked that they went young yeah. because the names that they were floating around, Mark Rylance was even floating around. Really? As, yeah, oh, I mean, I they, they they had been considering actors all over the spectrum and yeah. uh, and they landed on Will Poulter. Now, the idea that they've stayed young yeah. is fascinating to me. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, listen, it is one of my favorite novels by Stephen King, if not the favorite, and I have great nostalgia love for the TV series, Mm -hmm. but man, if there isn't ever a need for a big budget adaptation of it, this is it. And I was so yeah, we're we're gonna fix that in post. Yeah, we'll just. We're all. I don't know. I don't know if anybody can see this. This is just. This is so funny to me. It's like everything's falling over, just like the it. Domino effect. Okay, sorry, you were making such good points. So Please. what I would say was, I was really excited when Fukunaga was, it, was involved in this and Poulter as Pennywise. That was a home run for me. And then when it fell apart, I mean, it, it broke my heart. So this now, I'm a little bit hesitant. I'm not too crazy about the director. I'm not too crazy. I, I have known nothing of this Scars Guard. So it's, yeah, I can look at his, at his headshot here and go, yeah, I could see a little bit of a child... Uh, whatever you want for a Pennywise. So I'm willing to give it a chance because it is it. Yeah. And I do like, I, at first I heard that the, the creative differences that caused Fukunaga to leave was because he wanted to split it into two movies. I'm happy to see that it's still gonna be two movies. That it's gonna focus on the kids at first for the first movie and then later <laughs> on the second movie as the adults. That is great, that's perfect, it's perfect for it. So I'm happy about it, but I'm still a little, if I don't know this, uh, Skarsgård, so. I, Pol- Poulter just sounded like, just knowing his work a little bit, I was yeah. like, whoa, that's that's out of, out of the box thinking there. I like that. Totally. Kind of a little evil genius. Uh, yeah. Perry, what are you, th- have you seen Hemlock Grove? I actually kn- have. Okay. I, I was assigned to cover it when it first started, and I lasted, I want to say, four episodes of the first season, and then, you know, work is work, season two came along, and I'm like, all right, I'll give it another shot. Burned through season one again, which was pretty miserable, I will warn you. Season two, however, got a lot better. And in terms of his performance, I actually am really into this news. I I think Will Poulter would have been great, but I've never seen anything from Will Poulter that says to me he he can act as Pennywise. Whereas his performance on Hemlock Grove, this dude's creepy. Mm. And he navigates that spectrum from somewhat likable but unhinged and crazy so well that I think he could really do a lot with this role. And in terms of the older actor versus younger actor thing, maybe the reason we're hearing more older names in the mix too is because perhaps they're casting the the first movie and the second movie at the same time. Mm. Like I know Hugo Hugo (laughs) Weaving was in there too. And I mean, I could see anyone pair up with him, but the, the one, big concern here for me is the director because I don't 
dislike Mama, but I was yeah. extremely disappointed by Mama, mm. yeah. particularly because I, have any of you guys ever seen the Mama motion test on YouTube yes. with Javier yeah. Botet? Yes. 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 So how do you have something that looks that good and then you bathe it in CG yeah. and ruin his work? Yeah, I, that's a very fair point. I, I don't know if we can blame the director for that. Something I, I wonder if that's a studio decision because Maybe. Universal, keep in mind, Universal who made Mama also was responsible for the Thing reboot right. and there was all the practical effects that were done for that movie and shot mm -hmm. for that movie yeah. as well and CG completely over it. Yeah. So I don't hmm. know if I good can. I don't know if I can blame the director or that's not. That's fair. Um, for me, this is, and I hate to say this because I don't want to be disrespectful. We all know how hard it is to make movies and to mm. get movies made, but this just sounds like B team to me. Yeah. This this yeah. is just, and and maybe, and you know, I don't even think it's because maybe a little it's because I knew that Fukunaga was involved and that was my dream adaptation. I thought what he did with True Detective really proved that he was interested in telling an authentic and horrifying and really scary story. Um, and I thought Will Poulter was a really creative, clever choice. And the fact that he had said, you know, Fukunaga said, look, uh, you know, uh, Will's audition blew me away. Considering the performances he's gotten out of some of his actors, I just thought, wow, that's a huge endorsement. Um, with Mama, I'm a fan of Mama. I actually probably like it a lot better than most people, to be honest with you. And to be fair, he directed those children very, very well. Yes, mm. So I could good, see good point. I could see why that's something that maybe the, the uh, producers responded to. But in terms of the Pennywise casting, I have to tell you guys a quick story. I don't want to say who I was talking to. But uh, so Neighbors 2 has this really silly clown scene in it, right? Love it. With I love Ike that I love the clown scene too. It's weird yeah. and disturbing, <laughs> but also hilarious. And somebody close to Ike Barinholtz told me that after that trailer came out, his agents got a call asking him if he wanted to audition for Pennywise. Whoa, damn. Now, it's so stupid. It's it, hard to even comprehend. I, that is the. <laughs> hey, what is it? Hey, just get every bald person you could possibly imagine for Lex Luthor. Oh, wait, clowns? Did that person ever act as a clown? Bill Murray was a clown in Loose Change or whatever. Get him in there. I agree. That is the point of my anecdote is that interesting and and b team so we'll see i i was not as impressed with skarsgård's performance as you are in hemlock grove i just see him and i see pretty boy uh i can't i can't you know lie that's what i, I see thought that. we've decided that those are the eyes of a killer right there <laughs> i don't they know are, this totally this looks like the eyes of a guy who goes to clubs on melrose and like i don't know it's well, just that not, is what his character in hemlock uh, grove was a little bit perfectly cast for hemlock I can see like 40 bodies in a basement when I look at that. <laughs> well, well yeah. maybe we'll have Skarsgård on the show and ask him how many bodies yeah. are in his basement. It'll be like 13. <laughs> All right, next up, in anticipation for The Conjuring 2 hitting theaters this week, Warner Brothers and New Line have released a promotional video featuring director James Wan, who is my fave, explaining that he wants to redefine horror and in essence bring respect and class back to the genre. Wan explained, with The Conjuring films, one of the things I really wanted to do was bring respect back to studio horror films, adding, we all want to make horror, a horror movie that people can take seriously. So, Mark Riley, would you like to see a return to a respected studio horror film like The Exorcist or The Shining? Oh, yes, please. Yes, yes, okay, Exorcist, favorite, second favorite horror movie mm -hmm. all time. So anytime you're telling me that you wanna get back to a return to this, and let me tell you something, James Wan, you've done it. You have redefined horror with The Conjuring, mm -hmm. as, uh, that is slowly entering my top five of horror movies all time. And I even said, I went out of the theater and I said, I haven't been that scared since I think the I last saw The Exorcist. Totally. And I compared it to The Exorcist. And he liked my tweet and Aww. I was very excited for the day because it's true, I think he really knows what he's doing in The Conjuring too. Let me tell you something, I loved it. And he's, he knows, I, it was kind of, it wasn't a lot of, um, it wasn't very surprising as far as like The Conjuring mm -hmm. was, but his craft is so on point. This guy knows how to make a horror movie. So I buy these comments. I know we're not buying or selling, <laughs> but I'm buying these comments. And James Wan, he can do anything he wants with horror movies as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and Perry, you know, so for our audience, we have all seen The Conjuring too. Uh, we all, we did, most went as a team. I had to go the next day, which I was super bummed out about. Yeah. But we have all seen it. And uh, don't forget, guys, that we are going to have our non-spoilers review of The Conjuring 2 is up on Collider Video now. The spoilers review will be up on Friday with the release of the film. But Perry, what are your thoughts on this? Would you 
like to see? I know you're a fan of independent horror as well. You mm-hmm. love indie oh, horror. Oh, absolutely. So um, do you think that it's possible to bring that class and that respect back to studio horror? For sure. I'm actually really glad when you read this, you emphasized certain things because it drove me nuts that this featurette is called Redefining Horror or Redefine Horror because I feel like by calling it that to begin with and by name dropping movies like The Shining and Rosemary's Baby, you get a lot of people who are like, oh, you're going to remake that? That's not how you do it. Or you're going to copy that and try to emulate it again and that's not going to work. And also, I don't want to exclude things like campy slasher movies, Thank horror you. comedies. Totally. And I feel like by having this discussion or just by having the title redefine horror period with those other titles, that's the risk you want run. But if we're talking specifically about craftsmanship, fine by me. And James Wan is leading the charge. Absolutely. Well, and Schnepp, okay, so uh, you were not the biggest fan of The Conjuring 2. Correct. Um, but do you think that, you know, do you think that these movies, even if you didn't love the second one as much as you loved the first one, do you think these movies are helping to maybe bring a little bit of respectability back to studio horror? Most definitely. I mean, James Wan is an incredible director. and that, Those aren't the problems that I had with Conjuring 2. Conj- the Conjuring was one of my favorite horror films of that year, mm-hmm. and it slowly made its way into, like, my top 20 of all time horror films it's really scary it works on so many different levels and it also has that quality it doesn't feel like a low budget film which there's nothing wrong with low budget films sometimes you it's enjoyable to see like a trashy low budget horror film but this definitely had that not like hollywood edge but it just had craftsmanship and that's one of the things that james wan brings especially to the to the conjuring 2 as well as the first Mm -hmm. film as well as all of his films is camera work a sensibility a style and a flow to the scenes that usually, you know, he thinks through everything. Why are we here? What's happening in this? How can I best effectively use this scene to increase the mood or ratchet Mm -hmm. up the tension? How can this make a good scare? That's really why you go see horror films in the first place. You want that kind of tension, Mm -hmm. you want that suspense, and then that release. So I think he's doing a good job at redefining that version of what a horror film could be on a bigger budget in a Hollywood type way. Sure, absolutely, and I mean, I think, I know for a fact that James would never ever disparage independent horror because hello, that's where he came from, yep. you know, and we've all seen Saw, I'm sure, right. um, mm-hmm. which launched a huge franchise and even the Insidious movies, which he did with Blumhouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The first two uh, were directed by him, very small budgets, even though they had stars like Rose Byrne and Patrick Wilson. Um, for me, you know, I, I, I hate to harken back, but I think it applies with something like It, say. The reason that I was so excited about this studio horror movie was that they got a real director yeah. like Harry Fukunaga on board. This guy's been nominated, his films have been nominated for Oscars, he's been nominated for Emmys. Uh, you know, I just think that this was a step in the right direction coming from New Line and Warner Brothers as well. And thinking, okay, maybe they saw the success of The Conjuring about making an adult, you know, sophisticated, scary as hell, intense, well-acted uh, yeah. horror movie and saying, look, people want to see this. Mm-hmm. That's that's why The Conjuring got us. I mean, I'm sure it would have gotten a sequel to begin with, but that's why they were able to get James back. The Conjuring was a huge, huge movie that nobody saw coming. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that it's almost like for horror fans, I feel like it's two steps forward, one step back, or one step forward, two steps back. It's like, you know, they get some things right, and yet they 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 don't quite want to follow through on other things. Well, it's this vicious cycle where you have really talented independent film directors wanting to get into the game, but then you run the risk of having them be pushed around by studio executives. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so you kind of, you, you can't really get around that because someone like James had had the opportunity to direct The Conjuring to his way yeah. because he proved himself first. But how are other people going to prove themselves if they get these big movies and then don't get to do it their way? You especially run that risk with horror films because the bigger the budget, the more people are going to have notes, the more yep. they're going to want to smooth it out to make it appeal to everyone. And horror can't appeal to everyone. That right. is one of the coolest things about having a niche market is it's not supposed to appeal to everyone it's rated r it's specific to it's going to scare the f f out of you it's going to it's supposed to be these people love this kind of genre and what james is trying to say is like let's ratchet that up Mm -hmm. to make it quality at at the same time but you're never going to appeal to everyone because if you start doing that you're going to lose everyone by 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 making it like take making it harder for people like fukunaga to be involved 
I, so. I agree. I agree. All right. Next up, the long in development new installment of the Friday the 13th movie. Riley, I see your Camp Crystal Lake t-shirt there. Oh, yeah. Uh, has faced delay after delay over at Paramount Pictures. Now that Prisoners and upcoming Wolfman screenwriter Aaron Guzikowski has turned in his draft of the script, according to an interview with Platinum Dunes producer Bri uh, Brad Fuller, they will be moving forward with an origin story of sorts. I cannot wait to hear what you guys think about this. So Fuller told TheRealWorld.net that the new Friday the 13th would not be found footage, which had definitely been right. the rumor, the word yeah. on the street. So it is not going to be found footage definitively. And that it would be, uh, quote, origin-ish, but it's an origin that no one has ever seen before. And he started by saying, obviously, Pamela, Pamela Voorhees, who is Jason's mom, and spoiler alert, the killer in the first one, you don't have to do the little thing. If they don't know that on this show, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this ain't the show you're yeah, looking you're for. You're watching the you wrong don't know show. Yeah. <laughs> so Pamela is going to be there, but it's different from what you've seen before. Now, in a different interview with Yahoo, uh, Fuller went, also went on to say, we're going to go back and we're going to meet that family. And co-producer Andrew Form also added, we're going to meet the family. You're going to meet Pamela uh, Elias. El Elias, damn it. I, we've been debating how to say it. Elias. Either. Who is Jason's father and Jason? You're gonna see how it all happened. Schnepp, do you want to see how it all happened? Can't wait to see the origin <laughs> of Jason. Was his dad a mad scientist? Elias? <laughs> Did he read his creepy bedtime stories? Who cares about the origin of Jason's family? It's idiotic to me. Sometimes I get like, when was the last Friday the 13th made? Wasn't it like 2000? 2009. Was it 2009? Nine? It was a long yeah. time ago. This is seven years. Yeah. How, how long does it take? to make a sequel to the Friday the 13th, the reboot that came out. And it was moderately successful mm -hmm. where they were like, yeah, hey, you should just too. make another like sequel. It. You've yeah. got the, everyone's ready to go. What What's going on? Year after year, I think it was like three years ago, I heard about the producers. Yeah, it's gonna be a, uh, you know, a found footage. found footage. And I was like, that's idiotic. I mean, sorry, you know, like when sometimes when people get, get like, they're like, you're producing this material and you don't know what to do. You're right. not even the right, you're not even the, in the right ballpark. You might be like a sports bro or some idiot who doesn't understand horror, and then you're handed horror, and you you don't know what to do. So you like kind of thumb around. That's what it feels like. I don't know these the guys who are in charge. Maybe they're great guys, but whatever. It just it's kind of ridiculous when you're handed a, a you know a property like this and nothing happens with it, and you just kind of fumble around like you're like stuck in a closet or something. Like I don't know where I am. <laughs> now you're coming up with like ideas like let's go into the origin of Jason's family. Couldn't sound like a worse idea. Yeah, I mean, I you know what's interesting too is that slasher movies I feel like are they're not what the audience is clamoring for as a subgenre. I mean, right? So not saying Fre Jason, not saying Michael but a real true slasher movie, which is what Friday the 13th yeah. is. You yeah. know, Sean Cunningham, who created this franchise, has been on the record saying, look, this is a meat and potatoes movie. Yeah. I, you know what I mean? So, Riley, where, what are your thoughts here? I'm totally with you. I mean, it's like, come on. Will you please take the rights of Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street, for that matter, yep. away from them at Platinum Dooms? Because the same thing happened with Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Their remake, they're like, oh, let's reinvent Freddy's origin story as well. And... Look how that turned out. Yeah, so, let's uh, really focus on that. Yeah, the not it, Freddy part. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And this just doesn't, like, I don't need to meet his dad. I don't need, look, we had a great origin story, I thought, in the reboot. You saw the, the opening credits were the, the basically Pamela Voorhees getting her head chopped off. Mm -hmm. And then move on. Yep. And I liked Jason as a survivalist in the woods. Totally worked. It was pretty scary. The opening, the opening kills were vicious yeah. yep. and I loved it. So I was kind of, it didn't really play through all the way for me. I thought there could have been some, you know, I don't know, but I, I was hoping, hey, you, you, you started off pretty strong. It is a meat and potatoes kind of movie. Friday the 13th was made in answer to Halloween, yep. mm -hmm. okay? It was just like, oh, there's a slot here. Put them in the woods. And what they did so well was making it Pamela Anderson for, or Anderson. <laughs> Freudian oh. slip, okay. wrong show. Pamela Anderson as a slasher, go go have at it there, Twitter. <laughs> That's a movie I wanna see, wow. Pamela Voorhees, um, what was I saying? The <laughs> fact that she was the killer was awesome. It was amazing. It was kind of new, it was new. That's what, uh, made Friday the 13th so special and then it was great when it came out back at part two and it's like the kids all grown up and he's going for revenge and we're off and running so now we don't need this 
Rob Zombie tried to do Halloween right. and do did the origin my, story. did the origin story of why Michael Myers is angry and is going to yeah. kill his family, and then and, and that turn. Oh, I hated those remakes so much. <laughs> So we don't need this. All Stop right. It. So we we know where we know where Riley right. and Schnepp stand. Perry, you're lucky I didn't lose my train of thought after that. Although now all I'm picturing is like sexy Jason as like a Halloween costume. I just which see Pamela is Anderson awful. like in a Freddy. Oh, it's gonna happen yeah. now. No, like, well, it it's is, happening. These Halloween costumes do exist. I have never worn one, but I know that they exist. All, all right. right, Perry, your thoughts. Well, back to the 2009 one. That opening sequence, I remember seeing it at New York Comic Con, and it was paired with like the the title sequence for Watchmen. It was my first Comic-Con oh. ever, my first panel ever, and I walked out of that like, this industry, this is the greatest stuff ever. And I thought the 2009 one was great. I wish we had gotten more of that a mm -hmm. little sooner. Sure. I don't really trust them with this. And yeah. I think part of the problem with this one in particular is, you know, the internet news culture. We right. have been talking about, I mean, they should probably keep their mouths shut until they have a concrete thing there. Until they shot it, for well, Christ's sake. That's what I'd say. Or even if they have just like a green light or something real to give us but the problem is we've been talking about so many different iterations of it so many different directors so many different ways it's going to be shot that at this point yeah i'm sick of it fatigue. maybe maybe fatigue, uh, fatigue, jason's man. dad is a is a werewolf <laughs> yeah from the like, like yeah the wolf from the man. wolf man like horrible Why not? ending yeah. you know i i the, the, so i'm glad you brought that up because for my money that is the most intriguing thing about this whole damn project is aaron guzikowski mm -hmm. yeah uh guzikowski Agreed. is a huge fan of the friday uh, franchise and uh not the one with Ice Cube and, and Chris Tucker at Friday the 13th. We're franchise. just talking about all the wrong things on no, the show well, today. Aren't I we? realize my abbreviation could have been <laughs> misconstrued, but he's a huge fan of this franchise. He is clearly dipping his toe into the horror world, writing for Universal on their Wolfman movie. You know, Prisoners definitely got a lot of people right. talking. Amazing Lo movie. People love Prisoners. So I'm curious to see what he has come up with. And if the origin story is what he delved into, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that could potentially be interesting. How many people remember the Friday the Thirteenth television show? Right. Oh yeah. Remember that I really remember had that. nothing to do with Jason. It was all these like right. enchanted objects at a and store. That store. Yeah. yeah. And the one, the girl with the one name, like Roby, I think her name was. She just that was her name, the actress. Yeah. You mm. should remember the redheaded gal from Friday the Thirteenth. I think her name was Roby or Robbie, whatever. But uh, that was like a fun series that had nothing to do with yeah. Friday the Thirteenth. It would almost be like. I would feel better about these guys saying like we're just gonna go crazy style like Halloween three season the witch yeah. we don't even we're gonna surprise you and not talk about like some origin story we're gonna watch Jason get born and just, it just feels like for them to announce it like this is just really kind of lame. Well, just to give them the benefit of the doubt though, when you think about talking about an origin story for Halloween versus this, at least this character kind of calls for it more so than Michael Myers. Yeah, because if you didn't know what Jason right. was after the entire time, all this stuff would be meaningless right. yeah origin i mean i do think though you guys brought up a great point about the platinum dunes uh you know they they did this with friday the, or i'm sorry nightmare on elm street and we saw how that all worked out right. plus yeah. uh i'm sure we'll get into this some other time but the leatherface prequel is also coming so uh you know we've got we've got a lot of origin stories coming for our favorite bad guys but that is for another day we are going yeah. to move on to our next segment are you ready yeah What's in the What's box? In the box? What's, in What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? So, I love that title. <laughs> that is so great. I hope you guys think that this is as funny as I do, because um, I'm clearly <laughs> amused by it. What's in the box is going to be our weekly TV portion of uh, of Collider Nightmares. And uh, don't worry, we have pre-approved our topics with Josh McCuga and company, the biggest scaredy cat in the world. We will not be stealing anything from TV talk. Uh, all right, so first things first, Outcast, mm. uh, the latest drama from The Walking Dead creator Robert Kirkman. Um, so Outcast premiered on Cinema. Max this past Friday. Uh, it was written for the screen by Robert Kirkman himself. It was directed by Adam Wingard, who we have already mentioned here. It stars Patrick Fugit and um, and this is also based on a very successful uh, brand of comics from Skybound as well. So um, Perry, I, you know, you and I have both read these comic books, and I'm curious to know how you felt about the pilot. Yep. So I covered this at South by Southwest in order to prep. I was like, you know, I'll read a couple issues. It took me a little while to get into it, but once I hit epi uh, issue uh, three or four, I had to buy them all, and yeah. I did, and I, I read every single one. And this, to me, is a really good example of an excellent adaptation, because one, you can, I've been talking uh, to Schnepp about this a lot, you can see frames from the comic in the show, and they're beautiful and haunting, and then 
two, at the same time, if you reread the comics and you look at the dialogue, they've updated it just enough. Mm -hmm. I found the main character in the comics a little off-putting, which is why I had a hard time getting into it to start. But here, with what Patrick Fugit does in that role, he really grew on me fast. And I think when you're looking at a pilot versus a whole series of comics, you need to hook people now. You need yep. people to get behind him right now. And they did a really good job with that. Uh, I think they did a great job with flashbacks because yeah. that's a really difficult thing for everybody to pull off, apparently. Totally. But this this feels natural. It enhances the scene at hand while also letting you experience what certain characters experienced in the past. And just to name drop someone, I didn't love the character of Megan yeah. in the comics. Ren Schmidt. So her, wow. Yeah. She, I'm favorite character in the pilot episode by far. Couldn't mm. agree more. You and I actually took the very same thing away aside from Ren Schmidt's performance, which I agree. I I thought I think she's fantastic. And I've seen the first four of Outcast, but Kyle Barnes in the books is very very hard to like. He is very hard to empathize with, and I think that they've you, I agree they did a great job. Schnepp, how about you? What were some of your initial impressions from this pilot? Well, I saw the pilot first, then I read the comics because ah. normally like with Robert Kirkman, Kirkman's horror stuff, I've been like kind of saving the comics like I've read all of his Invincible and all his other like kind of regular mainstream stuff but any of the horror horror comics I'm watching Walking Dead I'm like just waiting then I, the, so I was kind of approaching Outcast in the same way but after seeing the pilot I was like I want to read it right now so I literally read the first two issues like a couple hours ago and I thought they were fantastic but in it by seeing it reverse by seeing the pilot first and then reading the comic it's really amazing how uh, straight that's uh, obviously Robert Kirkman adapted his comic to the to make the TV show and it's it's a lot of almost word for word scene for scene verbatim which I kind of liked mm -hmm. like I'm fresh from and I actually didn't have a problem getting into the character because now I saw the TV version of that character which you're absolutely right you like can identify with him a little bit more than in the comic where it's like a little bit he's more isolated and you're like who is this guy and he's got some problems and you know I mean the TV show version beating the hell out of that kid yes. I was like Ooh. man this is rough man like full like punch face like man luckily he's possessed by a demon so it's okay because it was it's like damn there's a lot of child abuse in this yo totally. it's like kids getting chucked around like full face punching a kid and he's like i'll kill you and you're like all right it's okay he's possessed by a demon he's like i'll swallow your soul they didn't, they didn't go evil dead style but I definitely, I love the like kind of the weird, it was almost like an homage to this old horror film called The Hidden mm -hmm. when they would like, you know, or, or Life Force almost, the yeah, Toby Hooper Life totally. Force where they were like, oh, life suck force. the energy out of your mouth, kind of like that gross thing. So they're doing that and I love the way they set up like Outcast, what's it about? And then you find out he's out, he's the yeah. Outcast and there's a, only a few of them the demons really like him. So it's like, I like the setup of the TV show and I'm looking forward to, I think I'm gonna read all the comics like you and then just see how and where they go and I thought the combination of Robert Kirkman and Adam Wingard Wingard is really good in the world of horror and I want him to stay there never do anything else Wingard you hear me <laughs> never um, but um I cannot wait to see the entire series. Well, I'm so glad you brought up the uh, the child beating mm. uh, because actually full face punching. The full I face punching. You say that with a smile on you your face. You know, the, the child beating, sure, uh, which is not funny, by the way. I'm not making light of that. But in the context oh God. of uh, of this show, I saw this pilot at Skybound uh, months ago, mm -hmm. like probably six months ago. I mean, really early, and that was the thing that stood out to me. This was before I had read the comics. Um, was was that they went there? Mm -hmm. This is some. Thing that for me, I dropped off The Walking Dead. And part of the reason why I dropped off the TV show, The Walking Dead, is because I felt like it just won't go there. I, and maybe that's mm. because I'm a, I, maybe that's just me, who knows. But but what Outcast had for me, and what I think being on cable, and real cable, like pay cable, mm -hmm. means for me, is that you can enforce the brutality of mm. this show. These are real stakes, and this is an exorcism show. Mm -hmm. So if you're not gonna go there, it's almost like stay home. Right. Yeah. Um, especially because this is a drama, and that's that's a really important thing to remember going forward. So, Riley, those are my thoughts, but how about you? How did you respond to the pilot? Yeah, that's a great point, though, Clark, that it went there, because it got me from the very first shot with that kid and the cockroach. Oh, uh, so good. Just, I'll, yes. I'll just leave it there, yeah. because I was watching it, and I went, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, and that's what I want a good horror show to do. I was I was verbally saying things. I mean, girlfriend's in the other room. She didn't want to watch it, and she's just like, "What are you watching?" I'm like, "Go away, nothing, nothing." I it I loved it. I loved it, and it looks like 
Kirkman and company are doing the same thing they did for me with Walking Dead. I watched Walking Dead, really liked it, went back and got the comics, mm. and then just devoured the comics faster than I could even watch the, the TV show. So I'm in. I thought it was very promising. Um, I don't have the, the, the comic knowledge that you guys have now to see the, the transfer from like it directly yeah. from the comic into the, I like that. I like that idea, um, but just for this standing on its own, probably one of the best pilots I've seen. Agree. Mm. So that was very, very well done, and I love that my boy from Almost Famous is the, is is in it with Patrick Fugit. He is great. So I'm all, now I gotta get Cinemax. So there you go. Uh, that, I think that's what they're hoping too, is yeah. that America says, now I gotta get Cinemax. Yep. And speaking of, uh, Outcast has already been renewed for a season two. Nice. So nice. we know we are getting two seasons of this show. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention real fast is in regards to Adam Wingard. You know, I've seen a lot of his movies. I haven't seen all of them. But to me, this was um, stepping out of what he's most known for um, in a good way. Mm -hmm. You know, I still felt like this is Adam Wingard flavor, to use a schnepp term. Sure. Uh, but but it, it was a bit more of a grown up Adam Wingard, and and I think that that's great because the show has fun when it's time to have fun yeah. with the gags and the gore and all of those things. But I like that opening oh, shot, boy. like you're saying. But at the same time, I felt like he handled the drama yeah. really really well. Um, so yeah, so uh, Cinemax. Watch it if you want. Whatever. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to bully them, but I suggest you watch it. Okay. I'll bully them. Watch it. <laughs> Damn it. I'm going to tweet at you. All right. You heard it from Riley. Uh, next up, Jessica Lang uh, told, recently told Charlie Rose that she is 100% done with American Horror Story. Now, Lang won two Emmys for the Ryan Murphy FX drama, and last season was the first since her departure, saw Lady Gaga uh, lead the cast, and Gaga herself won a Golden Globe for her performance as the Countess. So um, Murphy and company have yet to announce the theme for season six, but it is uh, he has alluded to the fact that it will include two ideas. They're going to merge two ideas. One is children, which you have, if you've seen American Horror Story Hotel, mm. you know that children played a pretty important part in that arc. And the other thing is opera. So maybe Ooh. we'll get mm. some Phantom of the Opera, maybe we'll get some Suspiria, maybe we'll get a little, who knows mm. what we're gonna be getting. But what we do know is we are not going to be getting Jessica Lang. So Mark Riley, do you think that, uh, you know, Jessica Lang saying, nope, I'm out, I'm done for good, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing for American Horror Story? I mean, I think it's it's good and bad. I think it's bad for the fans that, that love that her as that anchor. And uh, I'm a little sad about it too. I only watched the first two seasons and then it's gotten away from me, but she was one of my favorite parts of them and she's fantastic. But I also think you gotta reinvent this. It's going on and on. So it's kind of nice that I think it's great Lady Gaga <laughs> got a, an Emmy. A Golden Globe. Golden Globe yeah. is this. I mean, hey, good, good on you. So you have to reinvent with these long series. Walking Dead is needing to do something like that, to reinvent it. You're, you're right on. I just wanted to comment on that, but mm -hmm. Yeah, good or bad, I think it's all in the execution of this. It's great that they're starting fresh with, with Lady Gaga and that moving away from Jessica Lange's my two cents. And Perry, how about you? What do you think here? It pains me to say this, but a big fat good. I yeah. think this is only a good thing for this franchise at this point, uh, series. Uh, she has never given a bad performance in any season she's in, but I think it's pretty clear that they've kind of run out of ideas on yeah. something fresh and new to do with her. Even though they are different characters, there's always something about each and every one that feels the same. And it's not like Hotel didn't work because she wasn't in it. And it's not like the fans were, uh, were uncomfortable or missing something without her there because I was not a believer in Lady Gaga when I first heard about her casting and even the first one or two episodes right. of the season. But totally. the second she had an episode where she could really act, you know, she wasn't just like scowling at the camera and wearing pretty dresses and whatnot. She was really good. She deserved that award. And I think she's going to take this thing to great places. We also have Sarah Paulson as an anchor. Sure. Yep. I mean, let alone the how many other people who so have many. come for regular. Evan Peters. Uh, I'm, Dennis O'Hare. I think Matt Bomber has yep. now suggested that he will be back for season six. So I think as long as we get a theme, a good theme involved, and that the writers and the producers of the show understand that they need to respect their audience because that was a major problem I had with Freak Show and I think that's something that they addressed and did really well with Hotel. I walked away from Hotel 
feeling good about the show, mm. being able to walk away. I know this is horror and there's violence and things are sad, people die, all that stuff. But when you can walk away from being invested in a show to this extent saying, okay, like this is, this is great. I can't wait for more. That's a good thing. Not how I left Freak Show, but that is how I left Hotel. I can't wait for this. Schnapp. Well, I have yet to catch up because like, I stopped with uh, with Hotel after the second episode because I felt a little like, ah, it's got a shining. This felt like too much of a mishmash. I was like, I'll just wait till the entire season's over and then I'll watch it like the way I've watched all the other ones. Yeah. And my favorite is actually uh, The Coven, mm. the third season. Mm. That's Gosh. my favorite of all of them so far. And I didn't mind uh, the Freak Show one. So, I, you know, but this one, I, I did not even know that Gaga won a Golden Globe. So now I'm interested. I'm like, all right. So Lang not being involved anymore, it's fine. You know what I mean? She did uh, th four mm -hmm. seasons, mm -hmm. and that's totally awesome. And she was great in all of them, and it's cool. I mean, a, there's a ton of the rest of the cast, like you mentioned, who are keep going on. And, and Murphy's got another series called Scream Queens, mm -hmm. which I actually thought was going to suck. And then I watched it and laughed my ass off and watched all of them. And I love that series. It's an homage to all things horror. So I think that, you know, if you haven't seen Scream Queens, they go hand in hand. So. Yeah, yeah you, bye, Jessica. We think you're awesome. So <laughs> you love you some scream queens, yeah. that's for sure. You know, for me, American Horror Story uh, season one is is my favorite. It's actually one of my favorite pieces of horror ever. Um, I've watched the whole season at, uh, series at least twice uh, for season one, and uh, and I just think it's brilliant. And I think you know Jessica Lang is is a fantastic actress. She's an Oscar winner. She's an Emmy winner multiple times over. Yeah. Um, but what worked for me about season one with her was that she was able to steal the show. The show was not built around around her. And um, and for me, it's all kind of been downhill ever since. And I agree, I think that once she became the anchor and the focal point, it was almost as though the writers sort of just said, okay, and you know, everybody else is like in the background, but we gotta work on her story. And it was just like, you guys, this is not, you know, with Freak Show in particular, that that wasn't, yes, Elsa Mars was, was a huge focal point, but to me, all of those other characters had so many interesting stories to tell that mm -hmm. they just brushed aside completely. Mm -hmm in lieu of you know giving her her swan song so i i agree i think that it's totally okay that she's done and you know what if she changes her mind later on maybe she'll come back and steal another season well aren't they all connected so you never know you, there you never go. know all right so next up we're gonna do a quick little fun thing called monster of the week so monster of the week is kind of like our spotlight section right so this is where we're gonna talk about either a particular film a franchise an actor a director or something of that nature and for this one we wanted to kick it off by talking about Toby Hooper's poltergeist which turned 34 years Ooh, old last wow. week uh, and I love poltergeist so much Schnepp uh, can you believe what do you think can you believe poltergeist is 34 man I feel old because I saw <laughs> that in the theater and it scared the crap out of me I'm glad you picked poltergeist because of all films that we've been talking about the Conjuring is the closest to Poltergeist yeah, totally. that I could possibly, like as an adult now, when I saw The Conjuring, the fear and the frightful moments of The Conjuring made me think back to when I was a kid seeing Poltergeist and how creepy and weird that was. And you know, the debate of how much did Spielberg do over the debate of how much did Toby Hooper direct, yeah. yada, yada, yada. It was a combination, you know, whatever happened, it was a good combination of how they made it because it ended up being a great film, has some of the most um, incredible, frightening sequences for like a PG yeah, film. Totally. Yeah, I mean, this is before they had the rating systems of PG-13, so it's straight up PG. And yet you see Coach tear his face off, like yeah. literally <laughs> peeling his face off, having these, insane hallucinations and as it's it's a very frightening film so i, I love poltergeist so if you've never seen the original you've got to see it agree perry yeah. how about you oh my you? god the thought of someone not having seen the original and actually i i'm not going to put down the remake I'm because with you. even though it might not have been the poltergeist remake that i wanted when they first announced it i had a lot of fun with it and to me that's a great version of a horror movie that is suitable for kids of all ages mm -hmm. maybe not the real original poltergeist because it would never have gotten a pg no. rating today ever no. but regardless that was one of my very first horror films ever i must have been like eight or nine i remember the friend's bedroom that i sat in when i watched it and i remember laying up at night and looking out my window and seeing the shadow of the oh, trees yeah. oh, on God. my on my shades and oh and i went through a big phase where i was afraid of braces because <laughs> i mean, that's poltergeist too but i was terrified of braces as well this thing sticks in my mind i think Part of the reason that now today, actually part of the reason I love slashers so much is because, you know, you could fight back 
Mm-hmm. Whereas the paranormal to me always gets in my head because what you can't punch no. a ghost. Right. You got to figure out something else. And I think it's because I had watched Poltergeist before I had watched the large majority of other classics out there. Sure. Mark Riley? I love this movie and I love that I'm able to keep dropping in my top five favorite horror <laughs> movies. <laughs> I did it with Halloween, Exorcist, and now Poltergeist. You got to add to your shirt collection. I then. do. I know. because And Friday the 13th is not even in my top <laughs> five movies. And I all I have are shirts of there um perry you said something that was interesting to me how you can't fight back about this and it makes me think of joe beth williams yes. the mother mm-hmm. running to the oh, room so good. and the hallway just stretches beyond this movie is so brilliant i love it so much i love the history of film with this whether it's toby hooper or steven spielberg the opening classic spielberg all the scares toby hooper that's my opinion mm-hmm. that's my take i think they're both hand in hand <laughs> But this movie is so wonderfully done. It's scary. Have we decided is it Native American Indian burial ground? It's not. Ground? Google right. it. It's it not. Is. I you think moved ev- the headstones, but you didn't move yeah. the bodies. Yeah, everyone's buried. Uh, uh, everyone lives on top of an Indian burial ground. That's, if you live in America, that's, come yeah. on. This that's set exactly. was actually on, built on a Native American exactly. burial ground. It, 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 it was. We just learned that. The Ghostbusters came in and the, <laughs> the things went up. Um, yeah, this movie, I can't say enough about how much I love it. If you haven't seen it, like you said, Barry, oh my God, it pains me to think that somebody wouldn't see this this wonderful movie, so go see it now. 34 years old, but it holds up very well. Absolutely, oh, yeah. and you know, one of the things I wanted to mention was I just recently went to the Cinespia screening of E.T. at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which is something oh. that we do here in L.A. in the summer times, and I noticed that uh, D. Wallace gets top billing in E.T. Yeah. And you know who gets top billing in Poltergeist? Jo Beth Williams. Yes. This is her movie. And yep. this is something that we never see anymore. Moms. This is a movie about moms. Mm, yeah. And this is a movie about moms who love their kids. And talk about fighting back. I'm getting chills just talking about it. She she runs up those stairs and that ghost knocks her down and she just runs right, right back, back up, up mm-hmm. those stairs. It is, it is, you know, we never get to see moms fighting back for the, on behalf of their kids anymore. It's, it's usually a dad's story. Or a surrogate mom like like Sigourney Weaver totally. and Aliens. She's hey, like, I the gotta Conjuring. Go. Yes, both Conjuring, conjuring so movies. That's right. These are and, and, and a double, a double moms protecting their children in the first movie. Absolutely. And I always, it's funny you bring up the Conjuring being like a parallel to Poltergeist because I always felt like Insidious was a weird kind of like oh, yeah. spin on mm-hmm. on Poltergeist. Definitely. Sure. But with all that being said, it's a great film. It's a and it's a real drama and it's funny. And also has a double ending. Like that's like yes. one of the first big budget horror films that Juan is talking about. Like it had a giant budget. It's definitely a horror film, but it had that like, oh, everything's over. Is it? No. No. Yeah. Even bigger ending. Crushes oh, it. it. And and I'm with you guys. I'm with you, Perry, on the Poltergeist remake. Look, it's not the best movie I've ever seen, um, but I will say I like Gil Keenan's <laughs> visual style, and um, and I like I like the updating that they did, uh, and that's all I'll say. So not a, not the best movie ever. Not saying go rent it. Definitely go rent the first one first. Uh, oh, yeah. But They're uh, here. Yes, indeed, indeed. All right. So finally, uh, before we get to our Twitter questions, we're gonna do a segment real fast called Jump Scares. Now this is kind of our address the council if you guys are Jedi Council fans or <laughs> <laughs> a Sorry, debate jump scare. or a uh, or a conversational segment. And we thought we would start it off by kind of talking about how we define horror because something I know a lot of people have talked about on the chat boards especially when we announced Collider Nightmares was well I don't like horror I, you know I don't know if this show is for me and one of the things that's really important to me and why I love the genre so much is because horror means so many different things horror doesn't necessarily mean a slasher movie doesn't necessarily mean heavy gore it doesn't necessarily mean supernatural it can mean so many different things so um, Perry I want to start with you you know how would you for these purposes define horror this question has given me such anxiety because every time i've been on the shows i keep trying to explain it and then everyone's like oh well is this uh this reality star a nightmare then you know you could you can cover them on the show and no that's not what i meant but i guess the way at this point that i would define horror, i feel really bad uh, like trying to create divides and eliminating mm, certain things sure but now i view it as having gone to so many film festivals i picture it as 
anything that will play well to the midnight crowd. If something mm. belongs on a midnight lineup at a film festival, and that can range from anything. It could be slashers, it could be paranormal, it could be extreme violence, it could be, I mean, it could be really just about anything. If it plays to that kind of crowd and will get that kind of reaction at that time of night, I think it belongs in the genre. That's a great argument. You did study. That was very good. I think you, you made your case very well. It only took me like four shows, but I think <laughs> I finally gave the definition I'm happy with. Schnapp, how about you? What, what constitutes horror for you? Well, from uh, being a little kid, Alien was like, a, that's a science fiction horror. So like horror can exist in all these different genres. You even have like, you know, Shaun of the Dead comedy horror. So I mean, these kinds of things for myself, what constitutes horror is a really good story that ratchets up over time, creating the suspense and a feeling of dread, maybe a feeling of unescapable, something bad consequences, mm -hmm. and also that gives you something human that you can relate to. You have to relate to the human characters and what they're going through and what transformation is going to happen. So also I'm always looking for what is gonna happen transformationally in a film. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite filmmakers, David Cronenberg, mm -hmm. used a lot of transformational Definitely. horror in his early work and that's something I look for in a lot of horror films is like, where's the character beginning and where's their story arc, where do they end? And that's sometimes in a really <laughs> bad place if it's a horror film. So those are the kinds of things that I love. Yeah, for me, there's, you know, there's no blanket term that, that it, you know, it is, rather, it is a blanket term. It can mean so many different things, but like slasher movies aren't every horror movie or, mm -hmm. or you know, body horror isn't mm -hmm. every, you'll hear us on this show use subgenres mm -hmm. uh, in term, that kind of terminology because it is such a, a big, uh, we paint with such a big brush. Riley, how about you? I mean, I go back to a very kind of innocent way of looking at horror and it's, it reminds me of my childhood. Horror, it, and especially kids, what do we do as kids? We try to scare each other. Yep. We tell campfire stories at camp. We say, you know, I remember having a babysitter like literally screw with me saying that there was a killer in the other room and I like took charge because I've seen Friday the 13th. And I'm like, we gotta get out of the house and call 911. She's like, oh shit, sorry, no, no, <laughs> kidding, it's fake. But we all try to scare each other as kids and I think that's the innocent nature of a horror movie. And it always reminds me of being a kid. I went out and rented Friday the 13th with my sister because we were just fooling around and my grandmother was taking care of us and we wanted to scare each other. And why not, let's watch it. And I fell in love with horror that day. So it, it, that, it can mean anything, but it, it always reminds me of my childhood for some reason. It's just fun and playful. And horror also reminds you of when you're alive. Doesn't matter what you're looking at. It could be a slasher film and get a scare and you're like, oh yeah, well, and what would I do in that situation? What would I do if there were a, like a ghost in a stretched out hallway? I'd probably get the hell out, but <laughs> You know, all those things. I have so many different definitions that I did have anxiety too, Perry. I was like, what is it? And then I stayed in that cabin in the woods this last week and I'm like, oh, this is horror. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I think I think you kind of, we all kind of uh, echoed the same sentiment. Whatever, you know, if it, what scares you is so personal. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, like, you know, I've seen a bunch of these Twitter questions being like, well, what's a scary movie? Because I haven't seen a scary movie since I was a kid. And it's like, yeah, well, nothing's gonna scare you like you were a child. Right. You know, when you're seven, everything, is scary um, and and you know it's so it is so subjective it, subjective it is so personal mm -hmm. um, so just so you guys know this conversation will go on throughout this series I have no doubt uh, but speaking of you guys let's get into our Twitter questions so please uh, if you guys are interested in sharing or asking questions use the hashtag on Twitter collider nightmares and we will pull your questions and we will address them here on the show um, so let's start with the first one, which was from KG Gold, uh, and the question was, what in your opinion is the most important horror movie of all time? Not necessarily the best. Perry, you want to kick it off? Again, this is another thing that is very subjective because yeah. when I'm talking about horror, my subgenre of horror is slasher. Mm. So when I look at it from that perspective, I can't go with anything else except Texas Chainsaw. That movie, yeah. in addition to Poltergeist, holds up better than most other classics out there. It is so brutal and carnal and horrifying, and I, really, there's nothing else like it. Like we had, that's the problem with a lot of these remakes: is it loses, it loses that brutality. Yeah, and yeah. Every single time I watch this, I I on uh, Collider.com in October ranked 
all the Texas Chainsaw movies. Oh, wow. And it's like before I, I rewatched them all for mm. that list, but before I even started the list, like obviously yeah. number, number and, one. And not just number one of the Texas Chainsaw movies, number one of the large majority of slasher movies out there. Yeah. I think that is must-see viewing for anyone who considers themselves a hardcore slasher fan. Great yeah. answer. All right, Mark Riley, how about you? You know, I thought about this too, Perry, and I was, I was Texas Chainsaw Massacre because of just what it did, how it was made. It's so it's it's kind of legendary and how it was made and what Toby Hooper did. Um, but I got to go with Halloween, my number one all time because it was an independent movie and it really wasn't. It it took a little bit to find its legs and Siskel and Ebert kind of put it on the map by giving it a good review because a lot of people were like nah. And then it went on to be become the most successful independent movie of all time and it arguably launched the slasher movie genre. Um, you could say Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I, I could argue that too, and and for it. But Halloween, just in the way it was made, how it, it kind of started, it kicked off the slasher mm -hmm. genre, in my opinion. I love the movie so much, the way it's made, just Halloween, that's mine. All right, John Schnepp. Well, before I could say mine, I wanted to add Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 with Dennis Hopper. Oh, has, God. It's oh, got my a, God. an added sense of humor to it, but it's also frightening as hell and like you can bump my sony bono we got you and know that's like just started the dance the, yeah, the leatherface I mean, dance there's so many amazing things in texas chainsaw massacre too that i sometimes can't separate them but like the first one is truly more horror based and more frightening that steel door closing oh, after that. So there's great. really things that are shockingly original and have, have been emulated ever since yeah but Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 has a special place in my heart because it's bizarre <laughs> as all hell. so bizarre. But the one I think that uh, affected uh, cinema and everyone is Exorcist. Yeah. Um, because mm -hmm. that was the first horror film that was kind of like what James Wan is talking about. It was taken seriously. It was given a big budget, had a lot of big actors in it, and it frightened everyone who saw it. People were passing out. People were leaving the theater in hysterics. It created this whole thing. It was like a must-see movie where lines around the block. They were, back in the 70s, those kinds of films were very far and few between Godfather and Jaws, Exorcist, before Star Wars, before the what you would call the blockbuster, yeah. are these films before blockbusters that were just like gigantic films that you had to see. We didn't have VHS tapes even. Mm -hmm. You just had to go see the movie. So yeah. people were like in lines to see this film. I remember as a little kid hearing about it, my parents wouldn't let me see it. They were like, nope, you're not going to see that. I don't want to see it. I had crying fits because I would watch like the Night Stalker as a little kid and like mm -hmm. they would let me see that. But I was like, it's got a demon in it. <laughs> nope. So I had to see it many years later. Very happy I did see it. But The Exorcist is that film that kind of like not only launched like possession films, you had Sentinel, you had a ton of other films mm -hmm. that followed suit, but it also gave people the chance to, hey, you know, we can tell horror movies. And I think it opened the door for films like Halloween and all the other films that came in the late 80s because they're only about five years after Exorcist, if you think about it. So. Sure. I mean, you know, and talk about respect for the genre. The Exorcist <clears throat> nominated for, what, 10 Oscars, mm -hmm. including Best Picture. When has that happened? Re the Silence of the Lambs, maybe? Right. Um, yeah, these are all good, good choices. And I think you can go back to even the silent film, German Expressionism, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Nosferatu. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, gosh, Nosferatu. these movies still echo go through cinema, horror cinema today. And, uh, you know, I the only other thing that I would add to the Texas Chainsaw Halloween slasher movie conversation is that you don't get either of those, in my opinion, without Psycho. Nice. Alfred Hitchcock's uh, Psycho point. is arguably the OG of modern slasher movies. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think for what it's worth, yes, it's a black and white movie. Yes, it's one of those things where everybody puts it on a list. But when I saw Psycho for the first time all the way through, I was in college and I if I hadn't known the twist if I hadn't known the secret at the end of Psycho mm. that would have floored me I yeah. mean the movie is still so well done it's uh it's dark it's funny and uh and you know broke a lot of the rules too in terms of genre Norman <laughs> Norman, Norman. Uh, kill her Norman <laughs> she's a whore no mother no. Okay, uh, next up, Testify to the Music at I Am Testify asks, uh, this is great, great follow-up. Would you personally be more excited for a new Chucky film or a new Texas Chainsaw film? And I'm going to jump in right now and say, guess what? You're getting both. 
So yeah. you don't have to choose. Yay. Are they doing a, a seventh Chuck they or how many? They sure yeah. are. Don yeah. Mancini has been scouting, the, was scouting back in February, the seventh film. Uh, apparently Fiona Dorif and Jennifer Tilly are both back. We don't know anything else about that. And Leatherface, the prequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, coming from the guys, the French directors who directed Inside, Ooh. which is a horror movie that a lot of people like. Uh, I wasn't one of them, but there are a lot of people who love it, and they are handling the Texas Chainsaw prequel. But pretend that you are not getting a new one of these. What do you want to see first, John Schnepp? I need to know Leatherface's origin. <laughs> like, who were his parents, and like, what did they feed you him when he was find five? Out. What What was his schooling like? I'd lo- I would like it, like at least an hour of like the background history. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. 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 What about Chucky? Who made Chucky? What, He's what the about Lakeside the origin? Killer, right? The guy who yeah. built the doll before it was the doll ever alive or anything. What, what was it's he doing? a piece doing? of plastic. How just many times there? did he go to the bathroom? That's actually a movie about a factory. Yeah. yeah. You just watch just it called, the whole time. Yeah. Go to the Chucky, or something Chucky like Inc. that. Yeah. We just oh, call God. it Chucky Inc. It's about the origins <laughs> of the doll. Yeah. Um, I would prefer to see, like, well, we're getting both. I want to just, when are they going to release Phantasm Five? I'm just going to get oh, off good, subject. Good, I want to see that rabbit question. and bring that orb back. When does fear? But yeah, I would, I'm glad they're making both of them. I think, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the newer versions of these films. I'm always going to give these films a chance. I might be like being extra tough on the origin just because it's fun, because it's stupid, and it's overused. And usually when they do do it, they're wrong headed about it because they're like, don't understand the genre. And they don't understand why it was popular in the first place. Let's put a new spin on it. Why not just make a good movie based on like taking it to the next level, taking it to the next step, not Jason Goes Manhattan. You know what I mean? Like. You learn from your mistakes anyway. Yeah. Uh, good answer. All right, Perry. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much going to echo that. And I'm, you know, I'm part of the problem when someone announces a Chucky movie, a Texas Chainsaw movie, a whatever, uh, Friday the 13th, Halloween, anything. I'm going to see it. So that's probably why they keep making them. And even if it's it's not as well thought out as I would have liked, I'm still going to see it. And that's why I'm going to play by the rules here and just say uh, I want to see Leatherface. I want to see an, another Texas Chainsaw movie, even though the last one devastated me. Oh, that yeah. yikes. Not only is that a bad movie overall, but there are some of the dumbest mistakes oh, yeah. I've ever seen in a in a big budget, fe- well not big budget, but big budget within this realm, feature film. Like things where the, the dates didn't add I up. know. Who, it, who misses something like that? And it just kills me. I laugh out loud every time when I watch that movie. And Alexander Daddario falls like three times in a row for no reason. Like, did, Was that in the script? Or did someone just see a blooper and they're like, we should keep that? So what leather that. face number was this? Six or seven? This was the most recent one. Oh, uh, well, that, see, if they Tex- only showed the family. Texas, Texas, Texas Chainsaw. Chainsaw. Texas yeah. Chainsaw and was 3D part of the title. Uh, it, I, right. thought, I thought I Texas Chainsaw believe that might be it. 3D. Oh, yeah, it you're was. right. You're yeah. right. You're right. You're because right. it was on the other night, And it's guys. been three years. Uh, 2013 yeah. was when was it came Chop out. Was Chop Top or the rest of the family in it? Or it was just Leatherface? Yeah, I guess I shouldn't spoil it, but it's something it's something that does get into backstory to an absurd extent. I would be very curious to hear your comments yeah. on this one. Can't John. wait. I'll watch it. Um, all right, Riley, how about you? Uh, I'm going to go the opposite and say Chucky. Oh. Okay, we need a Chucky film because it lends itself better. Chucky is a fun franchise, doesn't take itself seriously. Mm-hmm. It's a talking doll, for God's sakes. Yeah. It doesn't take itself seriously. So you can you can just do another one and just have this doll just kill everybody and have fun with it. And see, Leatherface and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's a mythology that they're still trying to crack, which I I just think they need to give up. That's my two cents. I don't think we need a prequel for a Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw, Origin, whatever the hell it is. But Chucky, man, give me more of them. I just love them. They're funny. He's running around. He's cracking jokes. He's got his bride now, so he can, you know, and they can go Bonnie and Clyde it all over the place as dolls. So give me that. Fair enough. Yeah. All right, last question from I believe his name is Michael Roach, but his na- his names were switched. I don't know. Uh, but uh, hi, Clark. If you had a chance to remake one horror film, what would it be? Mine would be London After Midnight. How have you seen London After Midnight? Yeah, do you have a copy? Is he the Roach Michaels, the only the guy one? on the planet with like the one copy of London After Midnight? The film has never been screened. I don't know how you could remake it. Very true. Fair um, points. All right, let's go around the table, guys. Uh, we'll start with you, Mark Riley. God, that's this is a hard one. I've thought about it. I was I was kind of hovering on Friday the Thirteenth, but then we started. I changed my opinion like midway through panel because we talked that 2009's Friday the Thirteenth. I thought did a great origin story. 
or or a nice reboot. Not we keep talking origin stories. We got to get away from there. Um, but a nice reboot. So, you know, I know we're getting another one. So mm, maybe I'll go back because I do love me some Nightmare on Elm Street. The the remake was just god awful. I think if you bring in a very good horror director, a good screenwriter, really focus. Uh, enough on the story and making a good movie, I think Nightmare on Elm Street could be relaunched to a whole new generation. Well, and allegedly that is happening. Yeah, Alleged, and, I know. And there were the rumors that it's actually going to be Dream Warriors. Yeah, mm. I, and and that I can kind of get behind because I love me some Dream Warriors. That's mm. my, in the Nightmare on Elm Street, that's my second favorite behind the original. Sure. So I could see that actually working as a rebooted and just picking up the story right in the middle with all these kids are all having nightmares because of this guy mm. who was burned alive and now he haunts dreams, go. Yeah, so. we, we, what we don't need is, an, is another, we don't need a clean nightmare. No. Right we get it, we know, yeah. we know what Freddy Krueger does. Okay, yeah. move on. It's like Peter Parker. If I have to see his damn origin story or one Batman. more time. Yeah, exactly. Batman. Or Batman. Is, That's What's exactly in the cave? True. Bats, yeah, we exactly. get it. How did his parents <laughs> What's die? In, they yeah, got shot, they got shot. The, the pearls, theater. we there get it. Pearls. It's we in every movie. It. Yeah. Uh, all right, John Schnepp, how about you? Um, I would love to see a new creep show. I'm wearing the t-shirt and I was like, hey, yeah. um, I also would like, I personally would love to remake Planet of the Vampires, the Mario Bava film Ooh. that inspired Alien and a bunch of other films. I mean, I would, I probably would change it change it completely but use a little bit of the basis mm -hmm. of that original story but I just love those weird like I'm a science fiction horror fan mm -hmm. fanatic really but it's like I love those crazy weird leather outfits they're like super futuristic I don't know that's one I would well, say well speaking of vampires and sci-fi vampires I uh, I want, we talked about it a little bit earlier but Life Force I want to yeah. remake Life great. Force because that movie has such a great idea and when you go back and watch it which I did about two years ago mm -hmm. I had never seen it I was just like oh heavens no it's and i was gonna say planet of the vampires is definitely has life yep. force elements so we'll team up let's but write this screen done and so. in my <laughs> but in my movie though the uh the space vampires in life force they're dudes no they're sorry dudes. i gotta have gotta <laughs> have both of them they're full dudes. nudity okay. on both yeah well so, that's the thing is yeah. that you know go back and watch life force and tell me what you think i think well we'll get into it some other yeah. time perry I am going sleepaway camp. Ooh. Oh, wow. I, right. I watched it when I was very young and I loved it, particularly because I went to sleepaway camp. <laughs> so seeing what goes on in this crazy situation and then going to camp and thinking about it, I had too much fun with it. But rewatching it now, I rewatched it for a dot com article two years ago, I think, where we kind of went back and forth arguing about whether or not it was really great. It's dated. It's dated oh, and God. it could use an update. I think yeah. this setting and this topic is really timely because it's how true. many kids out there are going to sleepaway camp? So right. yeah. I think this is prime for remake. And I actually think it's been discussed, but it's one of those things where people have brought it up and nothing has been confirmed. We have the sleepaway camp Blu-ray right yeah. here. Yes. Oh, hello. Right? Um, I love this I, movie. I, oh God, I saw that movie for the first time about a year ago, two years ago. I knew the ending, but I didn't know anything else. This movie is a, oh, Freddy. If <laughs> Sleepaway Camp for you guys who haven't Our seen it. Set is oh, falling apart. dear God. Wait a sec, hold on. This is only, it should just. Uh, no. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. No. Our first show is falling apart. <laughs> yeah. Ah. All right. Do well, the dance. I, think, I think that that is a gr as good as any place to end it. Perfect. Uh, we, we will demolish the, let's tear down the TVs next. Um, thank you all so so much for watching. I'd like to thank the panel. John Schnepp, where can the people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp, and also doing my rewrite of Videodrome 2, the other film that I want to remake. Nice. Uh, I would love to make that one. And that's where you can find me. And on Horror uh, Movie Talk, uh, what is it? Uh, Heroes. Collider Heroes, <laughs> Collider Nightmares, and a bunch of other things. I'm falling apart. Goodbye. Please, everywhere. You're falling apart just like our set. Perry, how about you? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at PNemeroff and also on Best of the Week every Saturday. Thank you guys again for all your support with this. This was so much fun. Yeah. Woohoo! Yes, yes, yes. And Mr. Mark Riley. Oh, uh, you can find me uh, at Riley around on Instagram and Twitter uh, every Thursday on the Schmoes No Main show. I'll be here next week for Collider Nightmares with yeah, it was really fun. And uh, guys, I know you're asking. I will be defending the belt against Dan Murrow. We just haven't 
figured a time out yet. Ooh. So Ultimate Schmodown, uh, check it out. Friday, new episode. I cannot wait for that, and I do not want to face either of you. You might have to, actually. <laughs> I know, and I don't want to. No, I don't uh, want to fight you. I mean, you're good. <laughs> oh, we're so nice to each other. Yeah. Uh, so thank you guys so much for watching. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Snapchat, which I don't understand, but it has a ghost in it, so it's very appropriate, <laughs> I suppose. At Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E. If you enjoyed this show, Tell your friends about us. Please share it, like it, upvote it, do all the things because we want to keep bringing you these fun genre discussions. Thanks so much for watching, guys. We'll see you in your nightmares. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.